Baseball All-Star break is getting here at just the right time. I'm Charlie Sykes. Sunday Insight starts right now. Good morning and welcome to Sunday Insight. In the week that was, President Obama goes to Texas for some fundraisers but does not visit the border, which has been overwhelmed by a flood of illegal immigrants, mainly children. Uh, I'm not interested in uh, uh, photo ops. Yeah, you know, photo ops like this and this and this and this and this and that one. He doesn't do photo ops. Closer to home, Governor Scott Walker's campaign says that it raised about twice as much money as Democrat Mary Burke in the first six months of the year. Uh, with that much money, both candidates hit the airwaves with new ads. Get used to it. It's only July. After a sizzling start, the Brewers slump, losing nine out of ten games. But they'll turn it around, we hope. But we start this morning with this overlooked story that you might have missed. Wisconsin has seen a dramatic explosion in the use of heroin, but why? A new FBI study says there are a number of reasons, but specifically raised questions about the role of free needle exchanges. The exchange programs are aimed at cutting down on the spread of diseases like HIV and hepatitis C by addicts using dirty needles. But the report said the needle exchange programs have distributed millions of needles along with the kits used for cooking heroin to inject it. That makes it easier for addicts to use the heroin they buy. The report says that the exchanges lower the logistical barrier to individual heroin use by supplying recipients a complete kit, also known as RIG, which includes needles, Narcan, and other paraphernalia needed to inject heroin. Now, while the intent of risk reduction kits is to lower the risk of contracting HIV, AIDS, or hepatitis C, the report said the kits also provide all of the necessary tools to process heroin for intravenous use. The FBI report said there are four needle exchange programs in 12 locations in Wisconsin, and in 2012, the largest program distributed approximately 2 million kits throughout the state. Joining me on our panel this morning, the Milwaukee Community Journal's Michael Holt, Milwaukee State Senator Leo Vukmir, political strategist Lynn De Bruin, and media trackers Brian Sikma. Okay, Leo Vukmir, you were involved in some of these debates about needle exchange. Does the FBI raise fundamental? The FBI raises fundamental questions about whether the needle exchange was a good idea. Is it time to rethink them? Well, I looked at the report, and I will have to tell you, it is very long on conclusions yeah. and very short on specifics. Mm -hmm. I remember grappling mm -hmm. with this issue a few decades mm -hmm. ago, and I would be very careful to attribute the rise of heroin use in the state of Wisconsin solely to needle giveaway programs. If you talk to most healthcare professionals yeah. and law enforcement, they will tell you it has more to do with prescription drug overuse, marijuana. Mm -hmm. use and just the pure potency of heroin today versus the heroin um, of the 80s. Okay, but the report doesn't say it's solely because of it. It just raises the question that we give out millions of these kits, you know, including all of the, all of the paraphernalia you need to in inject this. How is that not a legitimate question to raise about the unintended consequence of this program? Well, it, it is a legitimate concern to raise, but junkies are going to do it no matter what. And the bigger issue from a public policy yeah. perspective and a public health risk perspective is spreading HIV and hepatitis B and C to innocent victims. Okay, Michael Holt. Yeah, and, this, and some uh, representative of, of AIDS Resource mm -hmm. of Wisconsin said the same thing mm -hmm. that, yeah. that, that our senator is saying, that there is no correlation between giving this out. And I remember, though, there was real controversy when you were back on the county mm -hmm. board when they had the needle giveaway right. pushed by Amit. Did that raise the... Uh, the drug well, epidemic in Milwaukee yeah, County? No, and you've got two nurses on this yeah, panel right. today, and, and I totally agree with Leah on this. Needle exchange programs were created for one reason right. only, to stop the spread of deadly right. communicable diseases, not just between addicts, right. but between innocent family members, uh, partners, law enforcement personnel, medical personnel. It's a bigger issue yeah. than, than just well, the true. addict themselves. Well, that's true. And, but, 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 and I'm willing to, if there is any trade-off, and by the way, yeah, I read that report right. cover to yeah, cover, right. and the number one reason that group said yeah. that heroin was on the rise in the state of Wisconsin was the the inexpensive, how, how the price of heroin is dropped and other, the use of other potential drugs. But, but is there drugs. a trade-off? You're going to use the word trade-off. There, trade there is, is a... Have we, tra have we traded AIDS cases for heroin overdoses? Well, the, the amount of 
AIDS cases in this state has plummeted. Right. Th these programs are effective. Do they have some, can, can addicts use them inappropriately and abuse them? Yeah, yeah they're addicts, they're, they're abusers. Okay, I'm not I, 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 I guess that. the question is whether or not you have a well-intentioned program that solves one problem at the cost of creating another program, which some people are apparently reluctant to acknowledge. Well, no, I do believe, Charlie, that this yeah. is a very straightforward case where a program was designed to do one thing, yeah. but there are unintended consequences that come from it. Uh, it has prevented the spread of <laughs> HIV AIDS and other, and other forms of communicable yeah. diseases that can impact people besides the drug yeah. druggies and, and those are addicted to drugs. But we have to look at the facts here and, and from what the FBI has said and from the data what it points out is that there are unintended consequences to these public policy choices. This is a trade-off and we at least need to have an honest debate about the kind of trade-off we want to I always have. thought there was a fundamental flaw in the needle exchange program that you're doing it in the name of public health but there is no healthy way to inject heroin into your veins. I don't care how many brochures you have. What you are doing is you are enabling a very dangerous and and, and, then, and so, so so I don't think you have to deny that there is some you know some positive a aspect to uh, preventing HIV but the cost might be greater than we think because mm -hmm. you actually have as the FBI the report points out you've made it logistically much easier to be able to walk in and instead of having to put your own pack your kit together or, or, or uh, assemble it it's all right there mm -hmm. so you said before um, Senator Vukmir that the, the junkies are going to be junkies well, yes, except the junkies that quit. And I wonder whether or not the needle exchange program has disincentivized some of them from taking the, the best possible step, which was to quit. But if you think but taking I, a needle, whether yeah. the needle is clean and never been used or used, if, if you think that's the disincentive that's going to stop an addict from, from, no. from their addiction no, have, no, and get, get them ha, clean, ha, no, I think, uh, you know, whether or not they have clean needles, dirty needles, I think history has proven very clearly that addicts will use dirty needles right. over and over and over and again. I, it doesn't right. spur that's them right. to stop yeah. Yeah. using heroin. And I think what we have to look at is what are what are what are the ways that we can a attack the issue of the heroin um, right. rise versus yeah. not just handing looking, it, handing looking out at free heroin right, kits may not be the way to do there, it. But there are other issues that we can do, and and, right. uh, and we have to start looking at that. What has your solutions. glass half full, and what has your glass half empty this week? Let's go around the table. Michael Holt, you're first. Well, my glass is half full because I spent a nice, enjoyable holiday in Wisconsin Dells. But my glass is half empty because when I left, I filled up my gas tank with gas that was 20 cents cheaper than Milwaukee. Leah Hukumir. My glass is half full because the Supreme Court delivered key victories for individual liberty in both Burnell v. Hobby Lobby and Harris v. Quinn. My glass is half empty because liberals continue to tie up key pieces of legislation in the court system here in Wisconsin. Linda Bruin. Well, my glass is half full because once the Congress and President finish blaming each other for our failed immigration policies, they may finally agree on some reforms and provide relief to our border states. But my glass is half empty because it took more than 50,000 children crossing the border alone for politicians to negotiate and there's no solutions yet. Brian Sickman. Well, my glass is half full because the Legislative Audit Bureau <coughs> appears to be making headway in auditing the Government Accountability Board, the dysfunctional agency that runs Wisconsin elections. But my glass is half empty because misguided and unthinking legislators who helped create the GAB exempted it from being held accountable to the state's open records law. Well, my glass is half uh, is uh, half full because some city of Milwaukee officials are considering plans to turn the basements of vacant abandoned houses into cisterns to hold stormwater. They'd be called base turns, basement cisterns. My glass is half empty because this isn't a spoof from the onion. They are really thinking about this in City Hall. <laughs> Next on City on Sunday Insight, the Walker campaign launches a new ad against Mary Burke. And as we go to break, House Speaker John Boehner takes a swipe at the president. He's been president for five and a half years. When's he going to take responsibility for something? Today. A new ad heats up the race for governor. Last week, the Walker campaign launched this ad targeting Democrat Mary Burke's record on jobs. As Jim Doyle's Commerce Secretary, Mary Burke spent $12.5 million to buy a vacant lot for a company that said it had no plans to create jobs in Wisconsin. Now, what the ad doesn't mention is that the federal government is actually demanding that the state return the $12.5 million in block grant funds, saying the project wasn't properly, the money wasn't properly spent in the first place. According to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Burke's Commerce Department, quote, participated in a speculative land banking venture without ensuring that the funded activity would be eligible. Burke's campaign says it strongly disagrees. So was this a fair shot, Linda Bruin? 
Well, I'm not sure every Democrat's going to be thrilled with mm. my answer, but for political ads, it's actually a pretty fair um, ad. I think the part that I take the most exception to is that a lot of political ads leave out key and very important information. And one of the important informations missing from this ad is the fact that there was a taxpayer protection clause in the agreement, which was if the company, if Abbott does not build and, and create so many thousands of new jobs by 2016, those funds have to be paid back. So the likelihood of that's going to happen is minuscule, but as far as the building going to happen and the jobs, so the bottom line is those funds should be paid back. But yeah, so the but rest of the ad, I, I okay. can live with. Brian Sigma, I mean, she's got two big parts of her of her resume. Number one, her, you know, being a Commerce Secretary under Jim Doyle, and number two, Trek. She's going to have some questions about the outsourcing of jobs from Trek. But what about this ad? Mm -hmm. About $12.5 million. This is a lot of money. This was the biggest grant the Commerce Department had ever handed out, and apparently it went for nothing. Well, this is a, a very important ad, I think, and I think the one way it could have been a little more powerful is if it had mentioned the fact that the Housing and Urban Development, yeah. a federal agency, asked the state to yeah. pay the money back. Now, I think part of the Walker campaign strategy was to let the media find that out and then to push it out there, but the ad itself would have been a little more, had a little more punch to it if they included that detail. Uh, I do think this is a chance uh, and an attempt by the Walker campaign to highlight a legitimate shortcoming in Mary Burke's record while also trying to inoculate themselves from critics uh, who may attack them on their own job record or may look at some of the things Governor Walker's done. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really a condemnation of government getting involved in private sector development when you look at the ad. Okay. Yeah, right, Michael. I, I agree with Lynn. I don't know how you could, you know, put any kind of lipstick on this particular pig. You know, it was a mistake. It was an mm -hmm. error. And they're going to ride this all the way into November. This probably will not be the first commercial. They may make some adjustments. They may amend the commercial. I foresee this being a commercial from now until We're going to be seeing a lot of negative ads, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, this was yeah. Wisconsin. But oh, okay. Okay. Totally a fair yeah, shot. Yeah, as yeah. long as Mary Burke continues to, you know, hitch her wagon to Jim Doyle as his Commerce Secretary, it was fair game. And I think what it does is it's starting to show one of many uh, ineptitudes that we're going to see in her campaign um, as we go out. And the, and the Walker, yeah. Walker camp was quick to seize okay, on that. Okay, I, I think Brian made a very interesting point there, just to sort of almost in passing. You know, both candidates, I think, are going to have a problem with this because, you know, government does a lousy job of picking winners and losers, and there's, like, way too much corporate welfare in the state on both sides. Now, you may not want to hear it, but we're going to tell you anyway. Let's hand out some unsolicited advice. Michael Holt, you're first again. Well, mine goes to the Green Bay Packers, who are delaying the retirement of Brett Favre's jersey out of fear some fans will boo. Please, don't let a few knuckleheads stop this show. Yeah. My advice yeah. goes yeah. to DPI <laughs> Superintendent, Superintendent Tony Evers. Even Bill Gates realized the tide is turning on Common Core. Come to the table, work with the governor and the legislature on a Wisconsin solution. Linda Bruin. Sarah Palin has called President Obama a foreigner, a racist, socialist, terrorist, and anti-American. And now she's calling for his impeachment. My advice to her comes from a Republican president named Abraham <laughs> Lincoln. Mrs. Palin, it is better to be silent and thought to be ignorant than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. Brian Sikma. Well, my unsolicited advice is for five of the six Native American tribes who sent a letter to the EPA demanding the agency stop a proposed iron mine in northern Wisconsin. The MacGyver Institute discovered that all five of you have violated the Clean Water Act, so why not <coughs> stop polluting before you start preaching? Well, my unsolicited advice is to President Obama. Don't say stuff like, I don't do photo ops because, well, it's just cringeworthy. Next on Sunday Inside, remember Gary George, he's back and he wants to be in Congress. It's probably the most unusual campaign of the year. A one-time legislative powerhouse, now convicted felon, Gary George is challenging incumbent Congresswoman Gwen Moore, and he's out with an ad. If I'm elected to Congress, you will see serious efforts to get federal funds in here to make a difference to create new jobs. Okay, but here's the question. Does Gary George have any, and I mean any, realistic chance of beating Gwen Moore, Michael Holt? Realistic chance? Realistic chance. No. You know, I think he would have had to really have made some inroads, some serious, serious inroads by now. Yeah. You got a month to go before, right. you know, the primary. He needed a million dollars. He needed some clearly defined issues. At this point, I don't see it. There'll be some folks who will vote for Gary George. Now, you know, now there is the unique possibility, a remote possibility that some Republicans might cross over and vote for him. If that happens, then, you know, anything uh, okay, goes. Okay, because I, I really want to almost segue to another I issue because, you know, also on the ballot in Milwaukee County, you have Sheriff David Clark, you know, the African-American sheriff, 
running in a Democratic primary against a white challenger. Now, in order for David Clark to win, I think two things have to happen. He's got to have the African-American vote to come out, turn out for him. That's number one. And number two, conservative Republicans who might be induced to vote in the Democratic primary, maybe to vote against Gwen Moore, maybe to vote against David Clark. Do you see that happening? Yeah, you know, it's a little bit ironic because there's some black politicians, I, I don't know if you can just use the term mm -hmm. leader, some black politicians who dislike Clark and, right. and will support his opponent. Right. But the masses, the average black person on the street likes David Clark. They like that he's a stand-up guy, mm -hmm. that he's will willing they to say vote, some things. Will they, they turn they will out vote and vote? They but will, no, will they turn out and vote? I don't know if it'd be any unique numbers. But those who will vote will vote overwhelmingly for David Clark. Okay. As, as far as David Clark yeah. is concerned, yeah. I mean, I, I think he can't, you know, just sit by. He's got to take this seriously. But he is very well liked, so I think he will be okay. In um, a Democratic and, primary, though, I want to keep emphasizing. I don't think people realize right. that if he loses a month from now in that primary, he's done. Mm -hmm. And Democrats don't like Clark right. that much. And as for Gary George, you know, one thing I've learned in politics, you never say never. I know it's pretty much a long yeah. shot, but um, he is a very talented individual. I had the opportunity to serve with him uh, for at least a year in, in the legislature, and, um, you know, he, um, you know, never s ceases to uh, surprise people. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, 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 but I'm not seeing any, any, any campaign activity from either side. If Gwen Moore thought that he had any chance, she has money, she could be up there. I'm not seeing anything. What, David what Clark is about to put a, a bunch okay. of money in the black Clark. media. Okay. Yeah, I think Gwen Moore's it's got yeah, this. It's yeah. hers to lose. She'd have to do something, you know, some horrific thing between now and then. And she'd and have to say something foolish. She'd well, have to be no, absurd, she'd ridiculous. Have to, no, she'd have to do something <laughs> incredibly ridiculous. And, and you know, I think there's an incentive for some Republicans to, to want yeah. it to be Gary George. A convicted yeah. felon on the Democratic ballot would be kind of a hoot for the for the Republicans well, to run against. Yes, it, um, it would. <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, um, I, I think that Gwen Moore, not only does she have strong support, she she also yeah. is well funded, and what I think happens she to David Clark in this primary? Oh, I think he wins. Why do you think he wins? I think his name recognition is so strong now that he will still get. Um, you got the Barrett moderate machine. Moderate Democrat Look, support. Number one target for liberal Democrats in Milwaukee County has got to be David Clark's head on a stick, right? You know, but I represented a, an area that had a lot of moderate Democrats, and they were overwhelmingly in support of the president, but overwhelmingly in support of the sheriff. Okay, what is it that you don't get? Let's go around the table again. Michael Holt, you're first. Well, what I don't get is how Ted Nugent, who's the head of the NRA, could form his lips to say black people who voted for Barack Obama were spitting on Martin Luther King's grave. Yeah, you heard that right. Leah Vukmir. What I don't get is the lack of backlash against Attorney General Eric Holder as he harasses school voucher programs that are providing kids more educational opportunities. Linda Bruin. Well, what I don't get is why the Senate has delayed voting on 38 State Department nominees. Iraq is at war, Israel's on the brink, and we have an immigration crisis, yet 40 countries don't have confirmed ambassadors. The senators don't have issues with the nominees. This is a partisan fight over voting. How juvenile. Brian Sigma. Well, what I don't get is why so many liberals in Wisconsin are upset about the Hobby Lobby decision. You see, under current state law, Wisconsin employers must provide employees with contraception coverage. Before the Hobby Lobby decision impacts Wisconsin, the law would need to be changed or another lawsuit started. Hmm. Well, what I don't get is why local businessman Bill Penzi from Penzi Spices thinks it is a good idea to lash out at suburbanites and conservatives, calling many of his customers bigots, racists, and worse. He did it again last week. Maybe he isn't that interested in, in selling spice anymore. Next on Sunday Inside, our panel picks the winners and losers of the week. But first, here's your morning news update. It's time for our panel to pick the winners and losers of the week. Michael Holt, you're first. Well, my winner, Michelle Howard, who's the first woman to mm. be named a four-star admiral in the U.S. Navy. By the way, she's African-American. My loser, the Chicago White, Fox, White Sox baseball team, who handed out white ponchos to fans during a cloudy baseball game last week. It appeared from television coverage it was like a Ku Klux Klan rally. Oops. Okay, Leah Vukmir. My winner, Texas Congressman Steve Stockman, for introducing a resolution to hold the former head of the IRS tax exempt division, Lois Lerner, in contempt of Congress for refusing to testify before a House Oversight Committee regarding the IRS improperly targeting conservative groups. And my loser, well, unfortunately, the Milwaukee Brewers. 
Uh, after getting off to a great start in July, they have really struggled in these last few days. Linda Bruin. My winners are Milwaukee Mayor Tom Barrett, Council President Michael Murphy, and others who are pushing the state to stop dumping sex offenders in Milwaukee when they weren't from Milwaukee originally. My loser is developer Dagoberto Ibarra, who, caused, who called President Obama the N-word, accused Republicans of being Nazis, and said the Tea Party is like the Ku Klux Klan. While I agree we have an immigration crisis that these groups have, some of these groups have been cruelly insensitive to, his his message was lost in the racism and hatred he displayed. Brian Sikma. Well, my loser is former Republican State Senator Van Wangard. Research this week by media trackers found that Wangard has been consistently lying to voters about his record on concealed carry during a hard-fought primary contest that will be decided in August. My winner is Indiana State Senator Jim Banks. Jim is a friend of mine who has just notified that as a Navy Reserve officer, he's being deployed to Afghanistan in the middle of his re-election campaign. Jim is putting everything on hold to leave his family and his political prospects and go into harm's way. Godspeed, Jim. Well, my winner, Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner, is sponsoring legislation that would dissolve the ATF, a bumbling, corrupt organization that richly deserves extinction. Loser, President Obama didn't go to the border because he didn't want to own the immigration mess, but he does. And you know that it's bad when even Democrats and the hosts on MSNBC are breaking bad on him. He's my loser of the week. Thanks for joining us and joining my radio show Monday morning. It's on News Radio 620 WTMJ from 8.30 until noon. Have a great week.